Uh, so <laughs> we've talked about G forces, right? But as you, you know, we wear masks. We, uh, well, some of us do. Gonky would probably never wear the mask because of the pressurization. But we worry about <laughs> the other factor we worry about, especially as single seat fighter pilots, is the physiological effects of altitude. Just you know, the higher you go, the the tougher it is to to stay conscious because of various factors. What do you think is the the biggest threat and kind of how do we mitigate, you know, some of these things as single seat fighter pilots with, with what the body does and what is the body even doing? Yeah. I mean, geez, we talked about, that's one of the biggest threats to, uh, the combat aviator, uh, for sure. We lose a lot of guys with that. I think spatial disorientation is probably the other really big one, probably bigger than hypoxia, but hypoxia still remains a threat, but spatial D is just a, it's such a tough one to prepare for. And especially yeah. when you, when you get spatial D, it's just really challenging one to recognize it. And then two, even if you recognize it to, to solve that problem. And we had a terrible incident that happened when I was at Aviano where we lost a guy, got spatial D. Um, I was actually flying in that four ship that night and, uh, oh, no. yeah, taking off with four and coming back with three was, um, uh, was, <clears throat> that was a horrible, horrible situation. Um, I think spatial D is obviously, um, one that's up there in terms of when you look at the number of fatal mishaps across like the air force every year, um, probably as deadly as any of them, but then yeah, hypoxia as well. Um, you know, you get a cabin depressurization, uh, rapid D, which I guess we all practice that in the, um, in the chamber, um, or even a, a slow leak can, and you're not wearing your mask, you have your mask down at the side or something like that. And, you know, you're setting yourself up for, um, some major issues. Cause that's another one that's very, um, it's very, um, kind of sneaky when, um, you may not notice that all of a sudden you're starting to get a little more, more and more confused. Um, so that's one to watch out for too. Do you guys ever uh, experience a, a rapid decompression or, a... no, I had the hypoxia where it was the slow one because of the pressurization problem. Okay. You know, and that was, you no, know, it was at the worst, it was at night. Night is yep. probably to me the worst time to ever have it. Cause you, you know, like one of my symptoms is, so for those that don't know, we go mm -hmm. to the chamber or the, uh, now they call it the, what is the ROBD? ROBD, yeah. 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 And, and you got to tell them what your symptoms are because everybody's mm -hmm. different or whatever. And one of mine's light loss. You know, I start to, you know, things start to dim a little bit. But at night, you always have light loss. I mean, it, it, it's nighttime. So it was one of those, you know, I knew, the only saving grace was I knew the jet had a pressurization problem. So when you started feeling that euphoric feeling and like, hey, oh, crap, you know, the thing about the Navy is, you know, gonky, right? They're always 100%. And that's the difference between Air Force regulators and, and Navy. Air Force, it's a it's a schedule, right? It's the yeah. normal, and then you would gang load if you needed to. That's your Navy's, emergency setting, yeah. Yeah, Navy's 100% all the time. And really? then, yeah, and then now some of these newer jets with the OBOGs, they're having problems just by itself. I mean, the OBOGs are having issues too. Have you ever seen, you know, the onboard oxygen generation system problems that, that people have talked about? Because I know some Viper squadrons have it. Yeah, I have never been in a unit with the OBOGs. I remember they had the whole OBOGs kind of mystery debacle thing with the F-22s. You remember what that yeah. was going on? And they were, and I, yeah. I remember it was a Bones Flotman, I think was part of that. Like he was a, he's a pilot position that was like working that up. And I remember him telling me about what they were trying to sort out there. I've never been in the squadron with the OBOGs. So I, I don't, I mean, I know how it works, but I don't recall the exact specifics of where they were having the issues there. But um is there an airplane? Is there a specific airplane in the? I mean, other than the F twenty two, where, um, like, no, like, they have OBOGs issues. So, like in the Navy, the, the Hornet, the the original Hornets and the A models, like Mover flew had LOX bottles, and then the newer yeah. ones they had the OBOG system, and that thing, um, I I never I never trusted it. And I I had a hypoxia incident in it, but is there a is there an airplane in the Air Force that's kind of like? <laughs> you got to watch this Dude, one. The T6. I is mean, I flew the T6. Yeah. yeah, it had zeolite dust. And I still don't even know what zeolite is, but that was one of the things mm -hmm. that were like, check your mask for zeolite dust. What the hell oh, on zeolite? I'm not familiar <laughs> with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't, yeah. I, I definitely, I don't know enough about those issues they were having with the OBOGs. I remember hearing about it and looking into it. That's near the end of my active duty career. And I never really got the whole scoop there. Um, and, all the units I've ever flown with it, we use locks. Does it surprise you that um, there there's really not a whole? I mean, they on the civilian side they talk about hypoxia and symptoms, but there's no. There, correct me if I'm wrong. There's no retire uh, requirement for just a straight civilian guy 
looking to get, you know, a class one medical has never flown the military to have any kind of ROBD or chamber, right? Am I right no, on that? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I don't think the uh, airlines have any requirement for chamber. Do you guys do chamber requirement? I don't no. think so. <clears throat> no, yeah. that's, that's that really surprises me. Had, had something for uh, a high altitude endorsement or something. I thought they had. No, I got my low. I got my high altitude endorsement before I was in the military and it was literally, you get in an airplane, you go up to I don't know, whatever thousands of feet and you land and yeah. they sign you off. <laughs> what if you're flying aerobatics with any additional training that you have to do on G's or <laughs> hypoxia or chamber? No. Not for G's. I know. Cause I did aerobatics yeah. before I went into the military <clears throat> and there was just a, all right, don't throw up, you know, and that was yeah. kind of the end of that. No, I mean, that's yeah. such a good point though, because you know, like one of the reasons we do the chamber training is so you can recognize the hypoxia when you have it just because it is so, you know, um, just hard to recognize. And, and, and if yeah. you've never had that experience, you don't necessarily know. And you start to make, you know, the wrong call Yeah. in general aviation side. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Stewart. I mean the pain well, Stewart thing, right? Yeah. The pain Stewart one. That's a, that's a very famous one. Yeah. The seven, three, right. The, it's one of the South American, I think seven threes, right. The thing. Was it Hellenic? <laughs> Wasn't that Greek? Might've been Wasn't like maybe, Hellenic. The maybe it was intercepting them. Yeah. No, I remember when I had my hypoxia incident, I mean, I, you know, I'd had all the military training and I'd been in the chamber and stuff. And it took, it took me a while to be like, Oh, <laughs> like, I've yeah. been here before, <laughs> you know, it's like having a conversation with myself. I'm like, do something. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it could have saved your life. I mean, yeah, you would have like, done without that training for sure. Right. So and I always think about like the civilian guys that fly with them, like, man, you know, the, you, it's like they always used to tell us if you have any problems on your first cat shot, you're going to die because you don't know what normal is. <laughs> I'm like, that's probably like hypoxia. You know, if you have, you know, your first event, if it's the real one, you're probably not going to catch it. There's a good chance. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Doc, yeah. have you had any? Um, I mean, I had a friend of mine that he was doing like a functional check flight and they always, you know, they test the pressurization system and they, they go up high and stuff. He got the bends. Can you talk to the, have you had, you had to deal with that as a flight surgeon, kind of any pilots that you've seen that have had like the full on, uh, you know, rapid decompression where you, you get, it's not hypoxia, but you know, you're talking bends like a, like a scuba diver would have. Yeah. We had one case that I know of for sure that we had to dive when I was at Aviano. Um, it's less common definitely in aviation than in scuba, just because the, you have to go up so much higher to get the same pressure differentials than going down into the ocean. But uh, the U2 guys, when I was at, when I was at Osan Air Base, we had U2s there and those guys, it's always a risk. That's why they have to do all the uh, exercise and pre-breathing before they put the suit on and try to make sure they, and they have this um, breathe the oxygen and try to denitrogenate the body. Um, Cause essentially what the, what, what's going on there is, you know, we have, we're always, we're, we're not breathing pure oxygen in, in, you know, the air normally we get nitrogen in, into the uh, solution of the blood and then that's the nitrogen bubbles, if they form, become the problem. And so they become little um, areas that can obstruct blood vessels, right? So it's almost kind of like having a stroke, if you think about it. You get a little bubble that shouldn't be there. We call them gas emboli. Um, and then they could float around and wherever they land and stop is where you're going to have the symptoms. And so there's different kinds of, um, we call that decompression sickness, DCS. So there's the bends, which is usually where it, it's in a joint space. You know, it's like you start to get elbow pain or knee pain or hip pain. And then there's, we can get into the chest. They call it the, the chokes. Okay. And then they call it neuro DCS is when it gets up into the brain and that can cause all kinds of different symptoms. Um, like a stroke, you know, essentially a stroke. And yeah. um, the case that we had when I was at Aviano, um, yeah, this, this person landed and um, had these weird neurologic symptoms that we were trying to figure out. And then, if I recall what had happened in that case is there's, there's DCS decompression sickness where a person's just flying the bubbles form and they end up in somewhere. And there's another one called AGE, which is the air gas embolism. And that's when you have like a little tear in your lungs. And this guy had just finished like having like a bad cold, his first flight back and was doing uh, BFM. Oh, and it was during the, and it was during the, the G straining maneuver. He was probably, you know, really bearing down trying to, you know, do the G strain. And that's when he had his symptoms. And we think probably what happened was, he probably had a little injury to his lungs that allowed some air directly into the uh, bloodstream. And then he, they got up into his brain and he had some weird neurologic deficits and fortunately was wow. able to um, land. There was a whole in-flight emergency and we had to respond, but he landed safely. And then we, um, 
took them out and, and we had to dive them in the, in the, the, um, the dive chamber, the hyperbaric chamber, which all that was set up with the, the, the Navy set up all those, um, those dive tables on how to do that. Wow. You guys had to take, you guys had to transport them somewhere where they had that equipment, right? Yeah. So, I mean, every, every base has that every air base has to kind of have a plan in place for where's the nearest chamber, who are we going to use? It's one of the things the flight surgeons do is we kind of own that process. Like what's the emergency process? Whenever I would go on like a TDY somewhere, I get there on like the, um, what do they call it? The Advon team. I get there in the Advon team and, you know, I'm trying to figure out all these different things, you know, which hospital we're going to use if there's, a, if there's trauma. But one of the things I always have to make sure is I know that there's a chamber somewhere that if we have a DCS case that we can uh, go dive our guys. Yeah. There's what do you do in the deployed? <laughs> yeah. What do you do in the now, deployed location? You try to find the closest one. Sometimes, the, sometimes, the, sometimes it might be, "Hey, we need to get them back home." But then the problem is also transporting those patients because you don't want you yeah. you can't you don't want to fly them. You don't bring up the altitude again, so you'd have to maybe fly them in a situation where you can like overpressurize a cabin, get an aircraft there that can you know do uh, more wow. than the, the, the standard like pressurization schedule. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you docs actually do do work. Yeah. On, can you believe that? TDYs. <laughs> I thought it was just you, you know you make a go pill bag. Right or yeah. the you know the uh, the day after bag for all the <laughs> the, the, the rough nights and that's it. Yep, that's that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that the good old days when we used to do that. Yeah. <laughs>